All right, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11, if you would. Exodus chapter 11. How many of you, when you were kids, liked to put together models? You remember the plastic model? How many of you guys probably like to put together models? All right, well, very good. When I was a kid, there was a kid that lived right down the street from me, just a few houses down, named Cliffy Nicholson. All right, all my life I've been plagued with guys named Cliff, all right? But we had a guy named Cliffy Nicholson, and Cliffy was the best model maker in our, high, in our school. Um, in his bedroom, he had shelf after shelf after shelf full of models that him and his dad had put together. He had all of the paraphernalia. He had these little magnifying glasses that he could hang over top and tweezers. And, and this guy was a master model builder. Now his favorite section was his muscle car section. He had a whole section of GTOs and Mustangs and Corvettes and, and I think there was a Ford Escort up there at one time. Uh, had all kinds of muscle cars. Now, my favorite section was one that he had just started. He had started building model rockets, and he had them all. He had a whole set of shelves there. He had, you know, uh, he had all of the different variations of the Mercury. He had the Mercury Redstone. He had the Mercury Atlas. He had the Gemini. Um, but my favorite was his Saturn V rocket. It was three feet tall. And Cliffy invited me to come down to his house and help to put it together. And it was one of the greatest moments of my childhood. Now, I know what you're thinking. I can feel it. You're thinking, how did this nerd ever get a date, let alone a wife? All right. Well, um, it was all uh, about grace, literally. All right. Um, now, I tell you that this morning about the models, because this morning we're going to look at a model in the Old Testament. Now, think about what a model is for a moment. Um, a model is a miniature representation of something. You know, the, the Saturn V is 360 foot tall. Uh, Cliffy's model was only three foot tall. But all of the different components that made up that rocket were right there in the model. In fact, that's a picture of, of pretty much what that model looked like. The big one, not the little puny one. The big one, all right? And uh, you could take it apart. You could pull the different sections apart. When you pulled stage one of, off, uh, it would show the, the configuration for the engines on the second stage. You could pull the top apart and make the limbs separate and even pull out the limb and we would recreate the whole moon landing. We had a blast with that thing. It was all the components were there in miniature. Well, today we're going to look at a passage in the Old Testament that has a model of our salvation in it. Um, one of the key principles that you have to keep in mind all, when you're reading the Bible a lot of you are together reading the Bible with us so as a congregation. We're reading the Bible together. And then during the week, I, I prepare the message out of those passages. So this week, you've been reading these passages. But one of the things you have to keep in mind as you read is that every passage of the Scripture, when rightly understood, points us in some way or another to Jesus and the gospel. The Bible is really about one person. It's about Jesus. Everything's there pointing us to him. And now sometimes we have to think really long and hard. Sometimes you really have to sit there for a while and, and say, where is the gospel in this passage? In other times, it's almost immediately clear. By the end of this morning, you're going to be able to see very clearly that the Passover in the Old Testament is one of the best examples, the best pictures of the gospel in the entire Bible. And, and so what I want us to do is just sort of walk through this passage. Um, we're not going to get in super detail. If you went, and, and I'm sure there's resources that can look at all the little details, we're going to look at some of the big obvious points because I want to tell you something. Sometimes we get tied down in the minutia and we, don't miss, we miss some of the obvious. So I'm going to show you some of the obvious ways that this points to the um, gospel this morning. We're going to begin in chapter 11, and, and let me read the first six verses, because the first thing we have to understand is that the Passover involved a judgment of sin. Now, if you've been reading along with us, you sort of know the backstory to this, but let's just read it in chapter 11, the first six verses, and let me fill you in. 
It says, then the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So Moses says, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill and the firstborn of the cattle there shall be a great cry throughout all of the land of Egypt such as there has never been nor ever will be again now I want you to notice what is happening this is the tenth of the plagues that God sent upon the nation of Israel. Now the previous nine that he had sent, nine, I'm holding up five and saying nine, but nine, the previous nine uh, plagues that he had sent upon Israel, each were aimed at discrediting one or other of the Egyptian gods. The Egyptians worship a whole pantheon of gods. They had, you know, uh, a, a god that made the sun go up and go down. They had a god you know, the River Nile was a god to them. They had all kinds of gods, and each one of those plagues were aimed at discrediting one or other of the various gods. In fact, uh, the Bible points that out. Turn back in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7 for just a moment, just a couple of pages, and look in verses 14 through 17. And this is sort of a description of as God uh, reveals this. He says in verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out of the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Now notice what God is doing there. God want, he wants to, to be very clear to Pharaoh who is executing this judgment. He says, the, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you've not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. What's God doing there? God's saying, this plague that I'm about to send, Pharaoh, it should show you something. I'm in control. I am the Lord. I, I'm the only true and living God. And, and over in chapter 8, he does a very similar thing. In chapter 8, verses 8 through 11, then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me. It always amazes me that he waited overnight. I mean, if my house filled up with frogs and I knew that Moses had told me to do this, I'd be calling Moses about midnight, all right? I'd have a servant run over there and say, hey, uh, go over there and, and fetch me Moses and get him over here. But notice what happens. Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice the, to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to, com uh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow, and Moses said, be as it you say, so that you will know that there's no one like the Lord our God. Later on, over in chapter 12, he's going to repeat that same idea. Every one of these um, plagues were sent to discredit the Egyptian gods. Now you say, what does that have to do with a judgment of sin? Well, it's very important that you understand that at the root of every sin that the, is, is the sin of idolatry. The most fundamental sin that we commit is the sin of idolatry. Over in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, Paul picks up on this idea. And he says, look, God has revealed himself to us in nature. You know, you go out in the, at night. I do this all the time in my neighborhood. My neighbors think I'm crazy. Look up at the sky. What do you see? The stars. You see the heavens. You see the created order around us. All of that is there to reveal that there is a creator who made it. 
But when we refuse to worship, when we refuse to acknowledge God, what ends up happening is, is we create an idol in our heart. We make a God in our own fashion. I want to say this to you. I know a lot of people who belong to Baptist churches who have created false gods. The reality is, is what we really need to know is what does the Bible say about who God is? The sin of idolatry lies at the heart of all of our sin. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, the first sin ever committed. Let's think about it for a moment. God tells Adam and Eve, uh, you can enjoy everything in this garden except do not eat from this one particular tree. Right? We all know the story. Don't eat from this one particular tree. Satan comes along and he convinces Eve that God is holding back on her that God is not giving her something, that her life is not complete in obeying and living in a relationship with God, that what she needs is to experiment and find something else that will give her a deeper level of knowledge. And so what does she do? She goes out, she eats of the fruit after Satan had deceived her, and what happens? She brings sin. Here was her problem. In a sense, what she was doing was substituting God who she knew and creating her own false understanding of God. It was all idolatry. At the heart of every sin is the problem of an idol. And now God is announcing that judgment is coming. That here we are, we've, we've gone through the whole pantheon of Egyptian gods and, and you guys have not repented, you've not turned around. And so now there is going to be a devastating judgment. God is going to take the firstborn from every household, all right? And, and so th what he's pointing out there is there's a judgment day. Now listen, I want you to hear this. And this is something we have, we don't preach much in the churches in America today, and that's why we're in the condition we are. There is a judgment day coming. I promise you, there is a judgment day coming. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says that there is a day that is appointed for you to die. It is appointed once to die, and then the judgment the reality is that every single one of us in this room today is one heartbeat away from standing in the presence of Almighty God and having to give an account for our life. There is a judgment day that is coming where we will be judged. Listen, God knows everything, not only that you have ever done, that's scary enough, amen? That's scary enough. That God knows every single thing. Because here's the deal. We know this. You know, very few people know everything that I've ever done wrong in my life. All right? But God knows. And he's kept a record. And he knows every time that I've rebelled against him. And every time I've sinned against him. And every stupid knuckle-headed thing I've ever done. He knows perfectly now by the way that should terrify us beyond knowing what we've done he also knows what we've thought you know up here is really where the battle begins the battle over sin is really a, a battle that goes on in our minds he knows and we are going to be judged for it matthew chapter 12 verses 36 says I, but i tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for the empty every empty word they have spoken he's reminding us revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 reminds us there is a judgment day coming well this is egypt's judgment day and so the Passover involves a judgment of sin. Now, when we look to the cross, there is a judgment of sin. God is going to punish Jesus on our behalf, but there is a punishment for sin. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just the physical pain that was the problem. You remember uh, towards the end while he's hanging on the cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, it's in that moment that God the Father no longer can bear to look at his son. It's not, it's not like a father looking away because he doesn't want to see his son suffer. I'm sure that had a part to do with it, but it's more than that. All of the sin of the world 
every filthy, horrible, terrible act that has ever occurred on this earth, every sin was laid upon him. And for that moment, he bore my judgment. He bore your judgment. He bore the judgment of the entire world. That's an amazing concept. But it's captured here. There is a judgment for sin. But thank God, this Passover also involved the substitute. Jump over to chapter 12 and look in verse 1. He announces judgment is coming in chapter 11. In chapter 12, he begins to tell the Israelites, but I've got good news. Now you say, preacher, I don't like when you start off and you all talk about our sin. Well, you have to know the bad news before you know the good news. Amen? You know, if you're going to lose weight, you got to get on the scale and see the bad news. Now, if, unless you get my like me, then you get on the scale and you can't see anything. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> kind of lost that a long time ago. All right. And, um, and uh, <laughs> that was awful. But anyways, you got to know that you got to know what the problem is. The problem is sin and God is going to judge sin. But, but here's the good news. God has provided a remedy. He's provided a substitute. Look what he says in, in chapter 12. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be to, for you the beginning of months. In other words, he says, I want you to make this the beginning of your calendar. And there's a reason. God wants the Jewish people to remember this event for the rest of their days. He wants, he's going to instruct them later on about how to pass this on to their children. This becomes the quintessential moment in the Old Testament where God says, listen, this is so important. I want you to build your calendar around it. I want you to, to, to mark the calendar by this particular event. Notice what he says. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregations of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and you shall make uh, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall t take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. I want to stop here and I, I want to I show you something here. Every Israelite house is instructed to get a lamb. There are a couple things about this lamb I want to point out. First of all, it is a lamb without blemish. In fact, they were to get it early and keep it for a few days and to make sure that they kind of watched over it and took care of it. Why, what are they doing? They're making sure that lamb is perfect. It has to be a perfect lamb. Now, the reason for that is because that is pointing to us to something in Jesus. The Bible teaches it that Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I are, and yet he was without sin. He was perfect. In other words, when, when you look at the New Testament, you realize that Jesus has completely and perfectly fulfilled all of the law of the Old Testament on our behalf. He is without blemish. So when Jesus died on the cross, he's the only human being in the history of the world who can say he did not die as a result of his own sin. He didn't die because of anything he had done. He dies in your place. He dies in my place. He is without blemish. He is a year, it talks about the goat is to be a year old, which is interesting because that means uh, it would be conceived around the same time. This is kind of the marker for this year. They would have to take care of it and those kind of things and from the lambs or from the goats. And what's interesting else about it is that... Um, um, he's supposed to kill it on the 14th day of the first month. Now, in the Old Testament, that'll be called the month of, of Abid, or in the New Testament, they'll call that Nisan. They change the name a little bit later on of that month. But what happens is, is this is the same date on which Jesus is going to be crucified some 2,000 years later. 
Everything about this is pointing us to Jesus. And here's what that lamb would do. When they would offer up that lamb, they would take some of the blood from the lamb and they would mark it on their doorposts. And later on in chapter 12 here, God says this. He says, when the angel of the Lord passes over Egypt that night and brings judgment, brings the death of the firstborn in every single household, whenever he sees the blood of the lamb marked on the doorpost of their house, he will pass over. I can remember when I was a kid, we used to sing a song called, When I See the Blood. You remember that song? And it, I'm not going to sing it for you, I promise. But, but, but the words to it went, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. God is going to pass over, and what he's going to do is he's going to take, instead of the child or the firstborn in that home, God is going to accept the sacrifice that has been made of that lamb or that goat. That blood is going to cover his wrath. Now, why is that important? Because that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took our place. He's our substitute. Amen? That's good news. He didn't say you got to go and pay off a little bit of it. The price has been fully and completely paid once and for all. He is the substitute. When he died on the cross, he died as Joe Buchanan. He died as Cliff Easter. He died as Darren Rotman. He died in each and every one of us. He was the substitute that took the punishment for sin upon himself. And every time Israel would come and they would gather and they would celebrate this Passover, it was a reminder to them. God provided a substitute, but it was also pointing forward. Now, this concept of substitution, this isn't the first time that it appears. If you've been reading in your Bibles with us, you know that it actually appears the first time we see this concept of substitution is all the way back in Genesis. Remember right after Adam and Eve sinned? One of the first things that they realized, and here's what sin always does. Sin always promises that it will be fun. And for a moment, it sometimes is. I'm not going to deny that. For a moment, sin can be fun. But then it brings shame. And it brings separation. And it brings brokenness. Adam and Eve, they sinned. Up until this point, they had a perfect relationship. There was nothing between the two of them. They had a wonderful, perfect marriage. But the moment they sinned, listen to this. They looked at each other and they realized they were naked. Now that's not, don't get weird about that. What's happened now is they're embarrassed and they're vulnerable. And here's what happens. They're afraid to be naked in front of each other. Because all of a sudden that relationship is broken. And one of the things God does is he goes and he kills an animal. And he provides them with skins to cover their physical bodies. But let me say this to you. The blood of that animal covered their sin for a time. And you'll see it over and over again later on. When God gives the law in the Old Testament, when we get over to Exodus and, or, or over into Leviticus and Numbers, we'll be reading about the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest would come and, and they would take a bull and, and the people of Israel would all confess their sin and the high priest would lay his hands upon the bull, symbolically transferring all of the guilt of the entire nation of Israel to that bull and then they would slay it. Why? That bull was a picture of of the substitute all through the Old Testament. God is saying, listen, you can't deal with your sin problem on your own. A lot of people make that mistake when they read, read the Ten Commandments, for instance. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. A lot of people think, well, if I could just keep the Ten Commandments, I would be okay. I'd be all right. God would accept me, and I'd be able to go to heaven when I die. I've been a pretty good person. How many of you ever heard that? You said talking to somebody about what will happen after you die. What happens to your soul after this life is over? People say, well, I've been a pretty good person. You know, I've, I've, I've tried to follow the Ten Commandments. I've tried to be a pretty good moral guy. The problem is the Old Testament law is the prescription. And by the way, you haven't kept them. 
Because the Bible says if you failed at one of these points, you're guilty of the whole law. What happens? We've all told a lie. You know what the amazing thing is? God doesn't make any distinction between little white lies and big fat lies. All right? There's lies. He said, if you've thought about it, you're guilty of it. And so we're all guilty. And it reminds us what happens is we can't live a good enough life to earn our way back. So God says, I'm going to give you a substitute. Let me give you another word for that. I'm going to give you a savior. I'm going to send someone who will bear your punishment, will take your place and give you life. Flip over, hold your Bibles in Exodus, but flip over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. I have a, a love-hate relationship with the Isaiah 53. Um, I love the theology of it, but when I was a kid, our pastor preached, and I'm not kidding you, I think, uh, I think Pastor Strickland pass, uh, preached in this book, for a, uh, this one chapter, for almost two years every Sunday morning, and wanted us all to memorize it. At one point, I did have it all memorized, and then I forgot it, all right? So I guess I really didn't have it memorized, but I had it for a moment, all right? But, but, but listen to what he says in Isaiah 53. One of the most incredible pictures of what Jesus does for us here in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, look at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced, listen to what it says, for our transgressions. You see the substitution? When Jesus died on the cross, when they nailed him to the cross, they pierced him for our transgressions, for our sin. Look what else it says. It says, but he was crushed for our iniquities. When with was, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. When God punished Jesus, it brought you and I peace. That's why Paul can say in, in the book of Ephesians, in the New Testament, that, that now, um, uh, that, that, that God, or I'm sorry, in, in, in Romans chapter 5, that now Jesus has become our peace. He has given us peace with God through his death on the cross. Jesus is our substitute. He died on the cross for us. So the picture here in Exodus is of a substitute pointing us to Jesus. But, but the Passover also required faith. Did you know that? This was not just something, God says, I want you to go do this, but I want you to think about this. There was probably some joker sitting down there going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that God's going to judge the Egyptians and any house, any Israelite, by the way, he's going to judge their sin unless they go get a lamb, kill the lamb, take some of the blood and mark it on their doorpost. Yes. There was probably some joker that went, I don't believe it. I don't believe that. And he didn't do it. You see, it's not the act of doing it that saves the person. It begins with faith. They had to believe that this was genuinely and truly the word of God. They had to believe that God was really speaking through Moses. And then their faith was demonstrated by their action. By the way, that's the same way in the New Testament, is it not? In the New Testament, when, when, when God gives us a command, the way we know whether we believe it or not, or whether we really believe God, is do we do it? Do we put it into practice? That's why James says that, that there's a relationship between faith and works. We're not saved by our works, but true belief, true salvation always results in us being obedient to God. There are a lot of people who think what they want to do is get some fire insurance, I'm going to say a few words, I'm going to pray a prayer, and then I'm in. But I'm going to say this to you, that's, that's not the way it works. Yes, you must believe, but that belief must be the kind of belief that operates and, and begins to produce a transformation. It has to change your life. It has to be uh, putting in the faith. Look in verses 11 through 13, you'll see what happens. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. He tells them, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this ram, you're going to roast it, and you're going to fix some bitter herbs. 
Now, I know there are a lot of different symbolisms that are caught up in that, okay? Let me tell you the right ones. This was all about speed. It's all about speed. The fastest way for them to cook their lamb was to roast it. The bitter herbs, that's because you didn't take time to really go through and prepare them. They're supposed to sit down. They're supposed to have their clothes ready. And they wore different kind of clothes. Their belt wrapped around their... In other words, you're supposed to be dressed. You be ready because tonight you're leaving. Tonight you're getting out of Egypt. And they had to believe that. They had to sit down on that night and be ready. They were going to put their faith into action. They were going to believe that God was going to deliver them and take them out. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But they had to put this thing into practice. Several elements uh, are pointing here to their faith. They obviously had to believe that God was going to act. You have to believe that God is really going to do what he said he's going to do. That he's really going to judge Egypt in their case, in our case, that he's going to judge the world. That one of these days, that the things that God says in his book, he means them. You, you had to believe that by doing what, they, what God had said, by simply going through those actions, that that would bring about your salvation. You had to trust not in the symbol but in the reality behind that symbol, you had to trust that it was God telling you, mark this doorpost. Amen? You following me? So you have to, when we put our faith and trust in the gospel, it's not just saying words. You have to trust that the God who made these words, who God who made these commandments, you must trust him. Uh, that's the way it is all the way through the Old Testament. God spoke to Abraham. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. God speaks to Abraham. He says, leave this place and go here. God didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't really tell him how he was going to get there. Or even what it was all going to be like when he did get there. But what happened? Abraham believed God. And how do we know he believed God? He left Haran and he went to Ur. He put his faith into actions. It required faith. The Passover then brought about deliverance. You notice what happens down here in, in verse 21. He's telling them in these earlier verses, be prepared. And get ready. He gives them instructions about, here's what you're going to do. Um, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna celebrate this feast, and then we're leaving. Notice what he says in verse 21. And then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, and the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statue for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised you, you shall keep his services. I love what Moses says. Get ready. Do what God says. Stay in your house in the morning. But then you notice he's already talking about and we're going to keep this when we get to the promised land. You know what Moses is saying? Boys, we're going. We're leaving. God is going to deliver us out. And you know the rest of the story, right? God, that night, moves over the entire nation of Egypt. And every house on which there was no mark on the door, they took the first son of that family. But on every place where he saw the door or the blood, he passed over. And the next morning, God took the, Egypt, the Israelites and once and for all took them up out of Israel. He delivered them. I got news for you. That is a picture of our deliverance from sin. Amen? When we put our faith and we put our trust in the Lord Jesus, he forgives us completely. He delivers us. He gives us a new life and a new start. That's why when Jesus is about to die, he celebrates what I believe is the last Passover. We don't, we don't celebrate the Passover anymore. Jesus comes in and he says to his disciples, we're going to celebrate this, but then he institutes the Lord's Supper. 
And that is our great symbol and our great picture of our deliverance. Because what does Jesus say? He takes the bread and he says, this is my body. And he takes the cup and he says, this is my blood. And he's reminding them that what I'm going to do tomorrow is going to bring your salvation and bring your deliverance once and for all. Amen? It involves a deliverance. But finally, it came with a commission. Look what he says in verses 26 and 20 through 28. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? It's every year you're going to have to celebrate this Passover. And your kids are going to invariably ask in a very whiny voice, why do we do this, mommy? Why do we do this, dad? Why are we doing this thing every single year? By the way, I don't know that this would have been that fun of a celebration. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to eat some bitter, nasty herbs. All right? And then, by the way, there were other things that the Jewish people involved in this process, but it wasn't going to be an easy. But he was saying, when they ask you, look what he says. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. What God's saying is, listen, you have to pass this news on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Cliff and I have been talking a lot about this here these last couple of weeks. Um, I, last statistic I saw on this was 33% of the population in any United States under the age of around 35 says that they do not believe there is a God at all and has no religious affiliation. They call them the nuns, not N-U-N nun, N-O-N-E nun. It means they don't have any religious affiliation whatsoever. Let me tell you what that means. That means the church of Jesus Christ in America failed. And this task, we did not pass the faith to the next generation. And that's been going on for a long time. I mean, we like to blame. We like to say, oh, them young people, them stupid young people. No, 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 no. That's our fault. When we see the rise in that, it means that we have failed in the fundamental task that God has given every parent, which is to pass their faith to their children. It is failure in the primary one job that Jesus said for the church to do. What did he tell us to do? Go and make disciples of all nations. And what have we done? We've not done that very well. So what am I saying that we better do? First of all, let me say this. There's really only two things to my invitation this morning. Number one, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to come to know him. Turn from your sin and put your trust in him. Amen? Don't wait any longer. Judgment day is coming. You know, here's the, here's the, the thing about it. Everybody thinks, I'll just wait. I'll wait. I'll get saved, you know, later on in my life. The problem is you don't really know how long you have. You really don't. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. Not only could Jesus come back, that would be one thing, but you don't know how long your life will be. You say, oh, I'm young. I've got years and years and years. I hope so, but maybe not. The reality is be ready when he comes. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, I want to invite you turn from your sin, trust him, get it settled today. If you are a believer, <laughs> we were talking the other day, Cliff and I, I think John was in on this conversation too. We talked about, you know, we've got to have some discipleship groups that are meeting and doing some things. I talked about, I said, we've got to do a little seminar thing, a little training thing on how to become a disciple maker. And one of the first things I said is we need to define what a disciple maker is. A disciple maker is a disciple. Amen? The bottom line is, if you're a Christian, if you are a Christian, if you've been saved, 
Your job is to make other disciples. Amen? You know, it's like a donut maker makes donuts. He doesn't go to work and say, I wonder what I'm going to do today. He makes donuts. I don't know. I'm hungry. That's why I'm thinking donuts. All right? A guy goes there. You know, my dad worked in a steel mill for all those years. And he come home and say, Dad, what did you do today? He goes, you know, oddly enough, we built sheds today. No, they made steel. That's what they did. You're a believer. You're a disciple. Your job is to make other disciples. You say, how do I do that? Well, 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 let me say this. One is, just go do it. Amen? Go tell somebody about Jesus. Take them under your wing and just teach them what you know. Show them one stuff. Listen, we've got, if we don't, we talk all about, we got a big and important election coming. I'm going to tell you, here's what this election is going to boil down to. Which knucklehead are we going to elect? Because they're all knuckleheads. There ain't one of them that's going to, listen, it's not going to affect. Listen, I'm just going to say this to you. If you think politics will change our country or our community, or you're nuts. They're just a bunch of jabbering gas boxes. That won't fix it. But Jesus can. So go make disciples. Take your kids. Pass on the faith. You, we, we've spent all this time in America trying to become buddies with our kids and trying to be friends. And I, I, that's great. I like when my kids like me. I don't know, honestly, I don't lose any sleep if they don't, you know? But the reality is my biggest job, make sure they know Jesus when they grow up. That's your job. That's my job. Make disciples. That's why he gave that word. And there's a New Testament parallel to that. Let's take these principles and let's put them into practice. Let's put them into practice.